Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the MLA Productivity and Profitability webinar series, which has been broadened to include topics on beef, lamb and goats. It's great to have you on board tonight. My name is Courtney Cheers and I work with the webinar coordinators, Holm Sackett. This series comprises of a total of 30 webinars that will be presented by its completion in July 2020. These webinars are recorded and can be accessed on MLA's website at a later date. The title of tonight's webinar is The Impact of COVID-19 on the Australian Red Meat Market and will be presented by our guest speaker, Matt Dalgleish from Mercado. Bit of housekeeping before we get started for those that aren't familiar with the webinar platform or need a refresh. The control panel you can see to your right is able to be opened and closed using the red arrow so that you can enjoy the full screen view during the presentation. You should be able to hear us, but we can't hear you. So I'd encourage you to use the chat box in the control panel to communicate any questions you have during the presentation. Please make your questions as clear as you can so that they can be addressed with relevant responses. When you log out of the webinar, a survey will pop up for you to fill out. I'd encourage you all to take the time to fill this out. The feedback we receive from this survey is really important to the continuation of this webinar series as it allows us to assess whether or not we're hitting the right topics for you. So let's kick off the webinar for today. Tonight's presenter is Matt Dalgleish of Mercado. Matt works with Mercado as their market analyst and wool and livestock trading manager. Prior to joining Mercado, Matt began his career in 1993 with ANZ Bank as a technical analyst for foreign currency and interest rate markets. Matt progressed to the currency trading desk both in Australia and London. In 2012, he decided to move his family to a hobby farm on the outskirts of Ballarat where he could pursue a more rural lifestyle. Matt holds a bachelor's degree in economics and finance from RMIT and a postgraduate degree in education from Monash University. He is also the owner of a commercial piggery near Bendigo. We're very fortunate to have Matt presenting this topic tonight. So with that, I'm going to switch over to you if you're ready, Matt. Ready to go, thanks, Courtney. Uh, good evening, everyone. I've just got a few uh, bits of information on there just while I get my uh, pointer set up here. So um, you'll have that again at the end of the session um, in case you need to uh, send me a query via email or um, indeed follow Mercado Analysis on Twitter or follow myself on Twitter um, at Ballarat underscore Matt. So we'll jump straight into it and um, take a look at a few uh, cattle price drivers and what's been happening with them with relation to uh, what's been going on with this COVID outbreak that's been um, impacting quite a few of the um, world economies. We start off with uh, US live cattle prices. Uh, they're the global benchmark pretty much for uh, for the remainder of the world and certainly from an Australian perspective, the, uh, over the long term, the Australian cattle prices do tend to follow uh, to a broad degree what's happening in the US. We've got a chart of the national heavy steer in Australia in the green and the orange one is the US live cattle futures price on um, going back to about 1998. And you can see generally the trend is, is fairly similar. We have had a bit of noise uh, most recently in US live cattle and certainly um, it's been very um, tumultuous in, in, since, since January. So if we look at uh, where it's trading, now these prices are in uh, US cents a kilo. Um, and uh, started January, uh, the US live cattle was at 2.75 cents a kilo. We saw about a 25% decline to 2.07 cents uh, when the initial COVID-19 um, scenario was breaking. Um, thankfully, though, at that time when we saw those US cattle prices came off, um, the Aussie dollar also had come off around 21%. So that acted as a bit of a buffer for Australian prices. We didn't, we could remain competitive. Um, in those offshore markets with that Aussie dollar coming off. Um, so it wasn't as much of a, a weight on, on local prices. However, um, in the last probably well, coming up to about a month now nearly, uh, the second wave of sell-off in those US live cattle futures saw it go from 245 cents uh, down to just under 190 cents a kilo um, just this, uh, this week actually. So that's another 22% decline 
Um, however, this time around it coincided with the Aussie dollar rallying. Uh, we saw the Aussie dollar hit a low of 55 cents or thereabouts, and we're now up around the mid 60s, um, so up about 14%. If you look at the whole move from January till now, you've seen then US live cattle has come off around 30% and the Aussie is only off 10%. So that initial buffering or insulation we were getting from the lower Aussie when it was down in the mid 50s hasn't, um, hasn't persisted and that's meant that it's um, now starting to create a bit of um, pressure on, on our Australian prices. Just switch the chart now to looking at the annual average price. And again, it's still in US cents a kilo at this point in time, but it just goes to show you um, some of the impacts over the short term, short to medium term. Like I said, over the long term, we do follow the US prices generally in Australia. Um, but however, over the short term, the price can distort um, somewhat, depending upon what's happening with regards to supply and production ratios in either country, and also what's happening with regards to climate. So you can see on that, um, on the, uh, the chart that's currently there, the red dotted area in that 2013 to 2015 period was when we were going through a significant drought and during that time prices in Australia deviated quite a bit and we were at a quite a significant discount to the US prices. Uh, as we moved into a wetter period in 16-17 and the restocker activity got quite aggressive um, in, the, in the young store cattle market, but we also were moving into a situation of tighter supply as well. And so we saw for a period of time there that the Australian prices actually went to a premium to the US uh, very briefly. So in those short term periods, it can deviate, but, and, but it does tend to move back towards that line of best fit, which is the, the dotted uh, black line there you can see on the chart. So where we sit now in 2020 is the orange uh, point. So again, where um, the discount, the normal discount we see has been narrowed. Um, with this US live cattle prices coming off so aggressively, off 30%, like I said, uh, it is putting pressure um, on markets. Now, if you look at the uh, average uh, price for US live cattle so far this season, it's at around 245 cents. Um, but like I said, we're now under 200 cents. So the longer we remain under 200 cents, the more chance that that, um, that, that price is gonna start to drift towards the left, as that arrow indicates. And if we do see US live cattle remaining at these low levels, it is going to start to um, force that uh, Australian national heavy steer price across the left too and, and towards that kind of 175 cent level. US cents, don't get too panicked, producers that are here in USA heavy cattle to 175 cents, it's US cents. So if you're looking at an Aussie dollar off of about 64 cents, that would mean um, we're talking um, national heavy steer in Australia heading towards that 275 cent a kilo live weight price. If, um, if we continue to see this uh, US market remain in a doldrum. I'll just switch the chart again now just to look at the spread. So it's the same kind of scenario, but we're looking at the, um, the, the spread going back to 1998. And you can see what I was saying there, that the long-term trend, where I've got my pointer there, that's the long-term trend is a discount of around 33% that the Australian prices tend to have. The gray zone in between is where it's traded around 70% of the time um, over the last 30 years or so. And that's between a discount of around 20% uh, uh, to around 46% discount. And then I've got what's considered to be the extreme levels, which goes from around 59% discount to around a 7% discount. Um, anything beyond that level would be considered um, fairly extreme. And so those orange dotted lines are what you consider as the 95% range. So effectively, through this whole period, we've been trading 95% of the time between those two dotted lines. You can see now uh, this, this move with US uh, live cattle futures coming off so aggressively has meant that the discount has narrowed quite a bit. Indeed, in January, we were sitting at around 28% discount, and we've now moved to about a 2% discount and you can see what I mean by saying it doesn't stay up at a premium for very long. That was that period in 1617 uh, when we had that wetter, wetter period and also the tighter supply. Um, so you can see it's, we're quite at um, fairly abnormal levels. Obviously, another factor that influences this spread can be climate. And like I showed you before in the annual chart there with the dot points, we saw what happened during the drought in 14-15. 13-14-15 was where we went to a significant discount almost towards those extreme levels that again didn't last there for too long and it tends to try and want to gravitate back towards this uh, grey zone is what you probably consider to be the normal zone. And obviously the, fine, the final um, 
one of the elements that, that we look at when we're looking at these cattle price drivers is obviously feed costs as well. So we'll just switch across now and take a look at what's happened uh, most recently with regards to feedlots and the impact on COVID. Uh, that falling Aussie didn't just um, have implications for cattle prices, but it's also had implications for um, our grain price and particularly our feed grain prices. So that very aggressive sell-off we saw in the Aussie in March um, meant we, we saw a significant spike in grain prices. In fact, over the week, we went from something like $310 a tonne to $350 a tonne nearly just on the Aussie dollar falling. And then the week later or so, we saw a spike in international grain prices, um, which was coinciding with concerns around um, supply chain and being able to, you know, it wasn't so much a worry about the harvest or the international situation with regards to what was happening in Russia or North America um, in terms of having problems with the, with the um, growing period. It was more a worry around the supply chain ability to get product where it needed to be got. And so we saw a spike in the um, grain futures price and what it meant effectively was translated to a, an increase in prices domestically for feed. You can see that, that jump up in the input costs in the northern grain and also in the southern um, grain fed, uh, feedlot areas. We saw a significant jump in both those uh, prices for the inputs of feed. And that coincided as well because of those um, pressured prices for the uh, global beef scenario. Um, we saw um, the finished prices for 100 day grain fed and, and in the south also coming off. So, um, with both the feed price going up and the, and the finished sale price coming off, it obviously uh, put pressure on uh, feeder margins to see them get squeezed quite significantly. Um, in the south, there's, there, in terms of the gross margin, there's almost nothing there. And in the north, it's actually gone into a bit of a negative. So that started to flow through into impacts for uh, feed inputs here prices as well. Um, with, uh, with feedlots pulling their bids in um, last month or so, we saw bids pulled by that 50 cents. Um, responding to that tighter margin scenario. Um, just one thing I wanted to cover up on that's, uh, I guess all the media coverage has been on COVID-19, but um, for those that have been watching these markets for a while, and particularly last season, uh, the African swine fever hasn't gone away. Um, and so this year, the estimate, estimated gap in China in terms of uh, missing pork protein is nearly 25 million tonnes. Um, if you account for what's expected in terms of increased beef production, uh, higher chicken imports, higher beef imports, um, increased production locally of chicken within China, higher um, pork imports, particularly from the US and Europe, um, all of that in increase that what we expect in this season uh, accounts for around 9 million tonnes. So it does leave a remaining gap of around 16 million tonnes uh, this season within China uh, with regards to what's happening with ASF. And, that certainly had implications last season when um, the African swine fever was impacting their, their pork herd over there or the pig herd over there. Um, and it's going to continue to have uh, an impact uh, this season, uh, certainly if China continues to move out of this COVID epidemic and, um, and starts to open up and starts to go back to a normal consumption pattern, which it looks like it's beginning to do. Uh, we're going to have some uh, certain um, issues there. Um, one thing just before I leave this this chart is, is also this this uh, deficit of 16 million tonne, just to give you a reference point, um, the Australian, you know, the average Australian uh, production in a in year is around 2 million tonnes. So we're talking about a, a, a still a deficit in China of eight times, give or take eight times the size of the Australian beef uh, production on an annual basis. So it's a massive amount that's missing. And um, for those that have been watching uh, what's happening over China and saw the WHO announcement in support of China reopening their wet markets just recently, um, part of the reason why I think there's an imperative to reopen some of these wet mar markets, obviously with hopefully um, due process around biosecurity, making sure that um, we're not going to see another potential virus outbreak. But um, part of the concern is and why these uh, markets need to be open is, is obviously WHO and the Chinese government are very concerned about food security uh, for the country there and, and um, this gap of 16 million tonnes is significant so they do need those markets operating to be able to help alleviate some of that food, con food security concerns particularly around the protein space. So if we just take a look at what it means or what it has meant as well for the Australian context in terms of Australian beef exports uh, we can see on this chart, you can see the dark green is the um, monthly exports of beef from Australia to China last season. Uh, the dotted line is the five-year 
average trend line. So you see through all of most of uh, 2019, um, we saw very much elevated flows out of Australia into China as part of um, that uh, Chinese need to, to fill the gap that was missing last year in China due to ASF. Uh, indeed, it was up around 86% over the whole year for 2019, 86% above the five-year trend. Uh, and so far this season, uh, you can see there, we saw a very strong January, uh, a little bit of a dip in Feb as China was in the lockdown phase uh, for COVID or the, you know, in the midst of that whole lockdown phase. Um, but still, even even despite that lockdown, it was still above average. It was lower than last February, but it was still above average. And um, now we've seen into March a move uh, higher again. So um, it's actually been from February to March about a 9% increase in volumes. And that March figure is 39% above the five-year trend for March. So. Um, you know, if you're looking at uh, the impact of COVID so far in terms of Chinese demand, it had a bit of a blip in Feb, but it's, um, it's, it's still reasonably strong considering the historical perspective there. If we move across to Japan, uh, we can see again, it, COVID doesn't seem to be um, showing any real significant impact there just yet. Uh, the increases have been steady through January, February, March, so higher, higher each month. Uh, and pretty much in line with what we'd expect as a normal seasonal pattern with the, with the five-year trend as a guide. Um, the move in from February to March, uh, the Japanese uh, flows from Australia to Japan for beef were up 13%. Uh, and indeed, the strength of Japan now, and just that little um, dip we saw in China, has meant that Japan has now recaptured the uh, top spot for um, in terms of market share for Australian beef exports. Uh, so China were in top spot last year, but they're back to second place. Um, if we move to total beef exports, just to give you an idea of what the whole picture looks like, uh, we can see that um, even despite China and Japan not doing too badly for the first quarter, we have kind of levelled off somewhat in our total beef exports. And uh, the reason for that is that we have seen quite a, um, a drop away in US uh, flows to, from Australia to the US uh, through February, March and also South Korea have um, seen a reduction in flows there. So that's meant that um, the total beef exports, um, that subdued for every March has put us to around 7% under the five year trend. So uh, it's, not, um, it's not total disaster, it's still within that gray zone is what you'd consider to be the normal kind of fluctuation you could expect. We're below trend, but we're not outside what's normal. Um, so again, it's not panic stations, it's still reasonably good. Uh, and if um, China continue to move out of this COVID uh, situation and back to normal, we can expect that the Chinese demand should resume uh, again, similar to uh, what we saw from them last season. If we just um, switch across now to lamb exports and have a look what's happened there, uh, we can see on that total lamb chart on the left is um, that was also increasing throughout quarter one, so um, higher month on month numbers. Um, such that by March we're above trend uh, by about 6%. When I say above trend, I'm referring to that um, five-year average uh, seasonal trend line. Uh, so uh, in terms of the, the um, destinations, uh, it was above average flows to the US, Asia and Europe. Um, the only real downside in lamb exports uh, has been the Mideast. So the flows there have been declining uh, successively over the, the first three months of the year, uh, but not enough to get us below average. So Still a reasonably strong trend for overall um, land exports. Something that was really good to see uh, was this rebound in China. Um, if I just first draw your attention though to the 2019, the green line, we can see again that ASF impact last season was that Chinese demand was well above what we'd consider normal. That grey zone is the normal, so we're well above what was considered normal and indeed for lamb exports last season, they averaged around 47% above that um, above that five-year trend line for the whole of 2019 due to ASF. Uh, in 2020, we had a very strong January, but obviously February we dipped with that lockdown right in the midst of um, that phase. Uh, but uh, it's really pleasing to see a very big jump from February to March, an 83% increase, um, such that we're even higher in March than what we saw last season, this time last season in March. So a very strong uh, rebound in China and I, I suspect um, that due to them moving out of the uh, lockdown there and getting back to some level of uh, normality. So um, similar picture for land that we could be seeing 
uh, very strong demand out of China for Australian land this year as well. We take a look at uh, Martin, not such a strong picture uh, as land, but look, it's still not too bad. Um, if you look across the total figure, so that's figure three now on the left, which just um, come up. Uh, most of the key export destinations for Australian mutton were below uh, their, their respective five-year trend, so that's kind of meant, and that's for March, so it has pushed us below the trend line now, uh, just as we hit into March, uh, such that we're sitting uh, around 9% below trend now. Um, and um, that was, even even though we're below trend, if you look at the individual countries, um, the USA has had um, some good growth in their mutton demand from Australia, which has been an interesting thing to be, keep watching. Um, so they were also, USA, it was above trend, actually it was one of the few destinations that were above trend and they were quite a bit above trend by about 74% for March, which was quite surprising. Uh, and also China were above trend by 13%. So again, uh, even though the overall mutton was uh, below trend, China was still showing that their mutton flows that they're um, back above trend, which is, um, which is a positive uh, looking forward to seeing how uh, mutton exports from Australia go as, again, as China moves out of um, this uh, this lockdown phase of COVID. We'll just move across now back to cattle and uh, start to look at the supply picture. So one of the things we look at uh, fairly regularly at Mercado is the female slaughter ratio. Um, it's a lagged um, indicator that we get from ABS data. So it's usually around nearly two months behind um, current. So we've only got the, the figures for January Feb. Um, we can see last year with the uh, remnants of that dry period, we had very high female slaughter uh, through the whole year. In fact, it was well above the, the grey normal zone uh, and, and very much above the, uh, the five year trend. Um, so, uh, actually, I think this one's a 10 year trend on this female slaughter, my mistake, sorry. Uh, so, um, we can see that the average, if you look at the whole average annual uh, female slaughter for the whole of 2009, and it came in at around 55.9%, and that was the highest uh, that's ever been recorded. So the data for this goes back to the mid 70s, uh, and last year was the highest ever recorded. Um, you'd have to go back to about 1998 to see the previous kind of high, highest one, which was 52.1% for an annual average. And if you contrast it back to that 14-15 uh, period when we saw a significant level of destocking in the Australian cattle herd, um, 2014 average 50.4%, 50 50.4, and um, 2015 average 49.2. So um, the 2019 uh, season at 55.9 was exceptionally high, even considering um, that destocking phase uh, in 14-15. Um, in and of course, that's off a, a lower herd size too. Um, just looking at this female slaughter ratio, a key point to note is that 47% is the threshold between whether you're in a rebuild or a liquidation phase. Um, so January came in at 52.3, January 2020 came in at 52.3, um, quite high. In fact, higher than last year, which was uh, a bit of a worry. Uh, but February, we have seen a bit of a dip down to 51.9% for Seb as a monthly level. Um, we do know, looking at some of the uh, ECI data, that um, the rally in the ECI uh, during January was actually mostly feedlot buyers that were driving that, and it wasn't until February that the restockers started to take a bit of control. And we know that um, the restockers continued to aggressively buy young cattle through March, and so obviously we haven't seen the March figures yet, but we suspect that we're going to see um, that that impact of the restocker buying through March coming through to the uh, female slaughter ratio in the next month or so when when the March data gets released in May. Uh, however, what we have done at Mercado is taken a look at the relationship between uh, the female slaughter ratio on a monthly basis and what we call the restocker spread activity. So it gives you an idea as to um, how aggressive the restockers are buying young cattle at the sale yard. And looking at that restocker uh, activity via the spread, we've, we've been able to use that as a bit of a lead indicator uh, to create what I call an implied female slaughter uh, ratio. So the orange line is our implied one from, a, from our model that uses the, the restocker spread. And the green one is the actual uh, female slaughter ratio. So you see they're not too bad at kind of um, following each other. And if I just draw your attention to this final bit here, so that's where our data finishes here at. Uh, at, um, for the actual at 51.9% for, um, for February, but we can see this significant drop down in the implied one for March. So um, we are expecting 
uh, a further reduction, um, you know, kind of heading down sharply uh, when we get the March data, and we could potentially um, demonstrate then that we are we are technically back into a restocking phase uh, below that 47%. But we'll have to wait and see what happens in early May when that data comes out. Keep an eye on the Mercado website because we'll be um, we'll be putting something up as soon as uh, soon as that data is released. If we just take a look now at uh, supply with regards to sheep markets, uh, similar concept we, at Mercado, we, you know, with the female slaughter ratio for cattle, we look at uh, a measure that's uh, the sheep offtake ratio, and this is one that's uh, very kindly supplied to us by uh, Andrew Woods uh, at ICS in Wagga. So he's, um, he's the expert on this one. He, you'll notice that Andrew Woods writes our um, wool articles on Mercado, so we work closely with uh, him at ICS. And this is something that he produces that gives us an indication as to what is happening with regards to the rebuild or the um, destocking of the sheep flock. Um, so similar to uh, the situation with uh, cattle, where you've got 47% as the threshold between restocking and, and uh, liquidation of the, of the herd, um, for the sheep flock, 12% uh, is the 12% uh, offtake is the threshold. So if we're above 12%, um, we see the flock in decline, and you can see that um, yeah, when uh, when when you've got that uh, orange line above 12%, you see the flock in green going down, and when we're below 12% offtake, uh, you see that the uh, the flock grows, and indeed um, the grey areas there that are outlined are the periods in uh, time since 1982 that the offtake for sheep was below 12%, and during those times you can see. Uh, that the flock's grown, so significant growth through up to the to the 90s um, uh, until that disastrous uh, situation with the wool reserve scheme. Um, but then more recently, you can see growth in the flock through that 2000, uh, 2010 11 period, where it was a very wet period for the country, and um, and the offtake ratio went quite quite well below 12%. We saw growth in the flock, and again more recently in that 16 17 uh, wet spell. Uh, off take nearly to 9% and uh, growth in the flock. Uh, as it stands now, we're above 12%. So technically, we're in a, a destocking phase still for uh, sheep to sheep flock. Uh, but we have noted that we're, we have kind of turned the peak here uh, just back, uh, I think it must have been uh, kind of late, late uh, 2018, early 2019, and we, we peaked and we are in a downtrend. So as this um, data gets released too, we are expecting um, for that for that to move down below 12% and demonstrate that we're back into a, a rebuild phase for the, for the sheep flock. Um, so from that perspective, I guess uh, sheep and land producers can uh, take comfort in the fact that the tight supply is, um, you know, with that rebuild phase happening and the very low flock numbers we've seen at the moment, um, nearly 100 year lows for the, uh, for the flock size, that those tight supply situation and, and moving to a, a rebuild phase is going to remain in the producer's favour. Um, something else that's just been recently uh, published by Bureau of Meteorology is our three-month outlook for uh, May through to May, June, July, and um, looking probably the best uh, the best we've seen for late autumn into early winter for quite some years. Uh, you know, 60 to 70 percent chance of rain, good, you know, above median rainfall for most of the country. And so, uh, both from a sheep and cattle producers' perspective, we uh, we're at least got. Um, the uh, the autumn winter period in our favour this time as well, which is good to see. So, what does this kind of stuff mean for uh, heavy steer forecasts? Now, for those of you that uh, were at the last presentation I gave for Hunt and Sackett last month, uh, I put out a heavy steer forecast model um, that was obviously off uh, live cattle futures prices that were much higher, indeed uh, um, significantly higher because the coronavirus hadn't uh, really impacted and um, what I've got here is, is some of the input modelling that goes into the Mercado model for the heavy steer. Um, and so we're looking at annual average prices and then we're looking at annual average levels for some of these inputs. So I've only taken, there's more inputs than just the Aussie and the live cattle, but they're the two topical ones at the moment, obviously the, the two that have been most affected by COVID. Um, and so I've just shown you what the annual average uh, forecast inputs are being used by the model. Now I just will note that the live cattle prices are uh, the way that they go into the model there as they're presented on the Chicago Board of Trade, which is in US cents a pound. But if you want me to, um, I have just um, changed those respective levels to give you an idea of what it means for US cents a kilo. So 
Um, if you can recall back to that very first slide that I showed you where I told you that, um, that live cattle futures in the US are now trading sub 190 cents US a kilo. Um, these average prices I've got are what we're expecting for the average year. So if you remember, I said that currently um, US live cattle futures as of 2020 right now, that's sitting at about 245 cents a kilo uh, in US cents. Um, where if, you, if you're working off an input of 110 US cents a pound for 2020, which is that one, uh, that equates to around a 240 cents a kilo uh, annual average price for this year for US live cattle steers. So you can see that the longer we stay uh, below 200 cents, then the more chance this, this level is going to continue to go down and that will mean further revisions down for this particular model. Um, but at the moment, we're working off these prices and you can see I've got a scenario where if we do go into an extended uh, global recessionary phase, which is certainly what's being forecast by most of the leading um, economists around the world in the IMF, uh, you could see a period of time where we see US live cattle futures declining for the next two to three years on the back of that lower, uh, slower growth uh, globally. Um, again, even though we're looking at those declines, I'll note that those prices are all still above 200 cents a kilo uh, carcass weight US cents. Um, so, uh, sorry, live weight US cents. So that's um, that's something to keep in mind. That's why I keep referring back to that that 200 cent barrier is something that we really need to see. Uh, U.S. live cattle futures um, get back above that that level for these uh, for these prices to uh, uh, retain these levels. Um, and and the other aspect is the Aussie dollar. So we have got the Aussie dollar increasing over the next few years, and that's um, purely in line with the consensus forecast for uh, the majority of the uh, major banks uh, via Reuters poll. Uh, is what the uh, the financial markets are expecting. Uh, a bit of a similar scenario to what we saw for the Aussie in the GFC period, where we saw the Aussie come off aggressively initially, um, but then when it was um, evident that the Australian economy was dealing quite well with the GFC, uh, the Aussie dollar began to rally. Uh, so far, the Australian government's response to COVID has been, um, we can see by the flattening of the curve we see every night, it's, we're doing quite well uh, in Australia compared to some of our um, countries uh, in, in Europe and in North America, we're, we're doing much better than them. So um, the feeling is that we are going to be able to get out of this lockdown phase a bit quicker to, than some of those and hopefully have uh, less damage to our economy. Um, if we can continue uh, to ride on the coattails of the re-emerging China like we did in, during the GFC, uh, then that could help to see um, the Aussies start to creep higher again. Good news for, um, for importers but um, not such good news if we see an higher, higher Aussie, uh, not such good news for producers because that means our product becomes a bit more expensive overseas. Um, so again, all, all of these factors are, I guess, looking at a bit of a worst case scenario of a higher Aussie and, and a sustained lower live cattle price for the US. And what does that mean for the model? Well, it says um, for this season around 6.26. Now, these are carcass weight prices for uh, uh, national heavy steer. So at 6.26, you're talking about a 3.35 live weight price or thereabouts. Um, for 2021, um, it's now been revised down. For those that saw this modelling uh, last month, this was prior to the sell-off in um, in the live cattle futures. We're working on a much higher live cattle futures price. And so we had, I think, um, the forecast for 2021 last month was at 6.30 cents. It's now been revised down to 5.64 cents on the back of those lower US um, global prices, uh, and that equates to around a live weight price. That 564 equates to around a live weight price of uh, just over 300 cents uh, Australian dollar terms. Uh, then you see if we continue to have a, a, a slowdown re recessionary phase through to 2022 and 2023, um, this is what it means for, for the national heavy steer moving towards um, the, you know, the, the next few years. So 472 cents carcass weight equates to around a 255 live weight price on annual, as an annual average, and then 422 is around a 230 cent a kilo live weight price for 2023. So not as not as robust forecast, um, unfortunately, is what we portrayed now last month uh, for the Homes and Sacred MLA webinar. But um, it's just the mere fact of what's happening globally, and if we do return back to those um, long-term global levels. That's what's in store for, for Australia now based off the, the current uh, modelling inputs we're, we're using there. Uh, I'll just hark back to, uh, for those that did see the webinar, um, 
the last month it was on the restocker market. Um, I'm sure it's it's certainly available still on the MLA website. If you didn't see it, I could recommend you go back and have a look at that. I did present this trade matrix. Um, and, and at that stage when I was talking, we had our forecast, uh, potential forecast for um, for finished cattle, heavy cattle, uh, and that's the heavy cattle on the top there. Um, in live weight prices, the forecasts are more in line with the 325 to 350. And we're looking at a grass fed, uh, fairly simple trade where you've got um, cattle going in at 350 kilo uh, and going out at 550 kilo, the heavy steer with a uh, cost per head as, a, as an approximation of $200. It covers your transport and other incidentals. Um, and so this here is your per head margin based off, off those metrics. So if you're basically buying uh, your young cattle at 350 live weight and, and then you're able to sell at heavy weight at 350, you're making $500 a head uh, gross profit on that scenario. Um, so back in uh, last month, we were working off these forecasts uh, on a much higher US market. However, um, if you look at the worst case scenario, say if we uh, end up heading towards a 275 live weight price for finished steer in Australia, um, you can see very quickly that those quite healthy margins we're expecting and what was potentially driving some of that restocker activity um, early in the year up above, you know, uh, into the high 700 uh, cent level uh, carcass weight uh, because there was still margin to be made on a grass trade. Whereas if we are starting to slide back as a worst case to 275 cents for the finished product, um, you can see the margins are going to be eroded very quickly there. So it's certainly a, a room for concern. Uh, it, it effectively means that uh, for those looking to buy uh, younger or store cattle, uh, once you're getting past that 3.70 cents a kilo live weight, which equates to around a 6.90 cents a kilo carcass weight, um, you're going to start to um, to find you're moving into negative territory on your margin there. Um, if if we do end up with an annual average closer to the 300 cent level, then um, then you you know you could be uh, able to get a bit more margin. So that's just um, one thing I wanted to recap on, uh, just to, to take note of what's happening uh, over the season in that US market, because it's going to mean uh, headwinds for the Australian market uh, you know, as, we, as we move into 2022 and 2023. Uh, if we just turn our attention now to the uh, Eastern States uh, trade land indicator, so the forecast model for that, um, we're, we're looking to see what a uh, uh, what a recessionary phase might mean for um, the East TLI. And again, modelling off a similar recessionary phase, uh, worse than what we saw through the GFC, where it, the recession is a global type recession that, that lasts for two to three years. Um, sheep and, uh, and lamb markets are very much a market that uh, is driven by um, what happens with regards to the export sector. Um, nowadays, uh, around 70% of our combined uh, lamb and mutton Exports from Australia, uh, it's 70 percent of our market is exported. A bit similar to the cattle situation. It's um, it's a huge uh, a huge marketplace, and obviously what's happening with regards to uh, demand in our export destinations uh, is driven by the global picture of demand. And if people are not um, doing so well economically in those countries, and there's less GDP per capita, then they're not going to be spending as much at restaurants. Um, they're not going to be buying as much uh, high cost uh, red meat protein like lamb. Um, so we've modelled now the impact of uh, that recessionary phase and uh, it, for those that have seen what we've put out uh, previously at Mercado, we were talking of, um, of uh, ESTLI average of above 800 cents for the next few years, that to 2022. Um, however, if we're moving into this recessionary phase uh, on the back of this COVID uh, situation, uh, it's looking like now that uh, the ESTLI is going to head back towards that 725 to 750 cent level by around 2022. So uh, not as robust as um, what we'd originally put out uh, earlier in the season, um, but obviously taking into account the impact of, um, of what's developing around the globe with regards to COVID. If we take a look at a similar situation uh, for national mutton, we had previously had forecasts of an annual average price of above 600 cents for the next few years for mutton. Um, however, the, um, the global picture as well is putting a bit of a damper on those prices so that we're looking towards a, uh, a movement uh, back down towards the 450 cent as an annual average price by around 2022 for, for the National Mutton Indicator. So just do a quick summary of uh, the situation and, and, and cover off on a couple of other topics that have been relevant to, um, 
to what's been going on most recently. It's a bit of a moving target, this whole COVID thing, that things are changing uh, day in and day out. Um, so it's quite tricky from a from an analysis perspective to keep on top of everything, but we'll try and cover off quickly on a few topics and do a bit of a summary and then we'll go to questions. So just looking at some of the key risks, obviously I've outlined uh, the picture with that global beef price fall and what you really want to keep an eye on there is that US live cattle futures, that, that pretty much is the benchmark global price as I indicated at the start of the session. Um, and that's something that you just want to keep a look at. Um, for those that are not sure of if they're looking at it in US cents a pound, which is what it's quoted on uh, on most of the uh, um, you know, apps you can see it on, or on via um, your websites. If you're looking at US live cattle futures, it'll be in US cents a pound. Quick and simple way is just to divide it by 0.454 and that'll give you US cents a kilo and then just divide it again by whatever the Aussie dollar level is and that'll give you your Australian dollar level. Um, but just keep an eye on what's going on there and if you recall, uh, one thing in this session, just remember that uh, that 200 cents a kilo US is that crucial level we need to get back above there um, and, and sustain it above there for um, for things to start to look a little bit more promising. Um, we have noted uh, that in recent times, particularly in the US, there's been quite a few supply chain backlogs. Um, some of those have been uh, shut down of US processing plants, both in the pork space for, for hogs over there in the US, but um, also uh, within the beef sector. Uh, most recently, I think it was around 9% of the processing capacity there in the US of beef has now been closed due to uh, COVID-19 infections in the plant, uh, with workers there being having to be um, having to be kind of kept away from the plants. Uh, and but then you've also seen a situation not dissimilar to Australia, where there's been a bit of a rush on uh, certain products and and uh, red meat protein being one of those. Uh, one of those that people have tried to stock up. So within the US, we did see a bit of a disconnect um, between what was happening with regards to the livestock price, and that's obviously that US live cattle futures price getting sold aggressively has been coming off quite a bit um, because of the, the closure of these plants and the, and the backlog uh, that's happening there, whereby um, animals coming off the feedlot are having not somewhere to go because there's not as many plants available uh, for them to be processed. And so that's been a drop in the livestock price, but um, at the same time, we've seen this rush on product uh, in the meat space, uh, so that we have actually seen the things like the 90CL, which is another um, indicator we look at closely uh, at Mercado, uh, that gives you an indication as to what's happening in that manufacturing grinding beef space. That actually um, sold off initially, but then it rallied back strongly when, when we started to see some of that panic buying in the uh, supermarket and retail sector within the meat um, meat area in the US. Um, so that at the moment we've seen you know, prices for meat product going up because of these supply chain concerns that prices for livestock coming off, which is um, a bit of a disconnect and it can't last forever, but it's certainly something that's um, an interesting uh, situation there. Um, if we just take a look too, with regards to the lockdown, both within Australia and through Europe and in, in um, North America, that um, it has changed the the um, situation for red de meat demand across products. So, um, you know, we're seeing obviously the food services um, restricted in terms of what they can sell. Some are trying to operate a, a takeout type scenario, but we have seen um, less demand for those high end cuts for the, you know, Uwagu and, and other um, products you'd normally go out to the food service uh, restaurant chain. And, and, and in the US, particularly lamb's one of those, one of those products that, that in the US, um, lamb's very much a high end product. Um, so we're seeing less demand from that side, but um, there's been an increase in the retail perspective. Um, one thing to note there, though, is that the, the you know when you're looking at those two sectors of retail to food service, the the spend isn't the same dollar for dollar. So even though we're seeing an increase in people buying product um, at the supermarket, they're not buying the same type of cuts that they would have if they were going out to a restaurant. So they're tending to buy the cheaper um, minced product and, and cheaper uh, cuts rather than the the high end cuts. Um, so that dollar for dollar spend is quite different um, and effectively as a rough rule of thumb, I did see a very good um, piece that was put out by a US uh, analyst that was um, saying that uh, for say for a 10% fall in food service, you're only getting about a 3% gain at the, in the retail side. Um, so yeah, that food service uh, situation is quite problematic for some of those higher end cuts. Um, and that's having implications then of course, the, um, the normal traditional methodology of how how uh, the meat works, how um, they can value the, the cost per carcass when they bring it in, this, and the potential sale price, it's thrown that into a bit of disarray as well. 
um, just because of this changing uh, dynamic of the, the consumer end of, of where these products are going and what's happening to the uh, final prices for these products. Obviously, um, we've outlined that slowing economic growth in, in some of the key trade partners, be they um, trade partners for lamb exports or beef exports. Um, that's, that's a concern ongoing. Um, and uh, and the, the longer and, and worse that slowdown is, then obviously it has implications for um, pricing as we head out um, into future years. Um, what we'd like to see is a, is a fairly short, sharp economic shock and then a recovery. Um, but it's a matter of whether that eventuates or not and what's going to uh, be the catalyst so that is, is how well some of these um, countries can control the spread of the virus and, and we have seen just recently in Singapore that we've controlled the virus very well initially um, but uh, in recent times they've started to get uh, reinfection and or not reinfection but uh, an increase in infection rates um, such that um, you know that they're having to kind of go back into a, a secondary lockdown phase potentially we're also seeing you know Japan's another country that has been um, having a very good, uh, up until recently, a very good uh, go at flattening their curve. And, and in recent weeks, um, the situation in Japan has, has been some increased um, spread of the virus there. So um, the potential for, for them to go into more severe lockdown too. So that's um, something we've got to keep an eye on as to how well some of these economies can control, um, control the spread of this COVID because um, what we don't want is to be going through a period of rolling lockdowns where you're going to lockdown for a month or two and then you come out of it and the virus comes back and you have to go back into a lockdown. Um, that could just drag on this whole um, potential for uh, for growth to get back on track. Um, so something to keep an eye on as, a, as an ongoing risk there. Uh, in terms of opportunities, I always like to finish off in a positive here with these presentations if I can. Um, so that ASF impact in China, it hasn't gone away, like I said, um, and the demand should China um, manage their way through this COVID crisis and get back on track, um, the demand will be there for Australian beef and lamb and mutton uh, in a similar nature to how we saw last season. So, um, you know, there is the opportunity um, for Australia to uh, continue to benefit um, from, from a resurgent China. Uh, we certainly hung on to China's coattails through the GFC and that steered as well there. Um, the potential is there for that to occur again um, and, and may insulate the Australian economy somewhat, providing we can also um, continue to flatten the curve here. Uh, obviously, the domestic supply situation for cattle and sheep, both in the producer's favour, um, very tight situation for, for both of those markets. So that, again, um, you know, yeah, is, is a good thing. And finally, um, that climate outlook that I went and showed you um, earlier in the presentation is... Uh, Obviously, one of the best ones we've seen uh, for a few few autumns and winters, uh, and it's really um, it's really got the uh, restocker activity um, looking like we could um, we could uh, you know, make some inroads there with regards to the rebuild of the herd and the flock. Um, that's pretty much it for me. There's, there's my details again. If you need to jot them down, uh, whether it's an email or a or a Twitter uh, account that you can follow to um, to see what I'm putting out there occasionally. The other thing I could point you towards. Um, just as a final little plug is the Mercado podcast uh, we put out on a weekly basis uh, called Commodity Conversations. You can get that, um, you can go to the Mercado site and find the link to it or you can just do a search for Commodity Conversations. You should be able to catch us pretty easy there. Uh, we generally put out a short version uh, podcast of about 10 minutes we try and keep it to, which is just a market wrap, a uh, short market wrap. And then there's uh, the occasional every two to three weeks, the long form uh, Commodity Conversation podcast that generally talks about a key issue. Um, just back, uh, actually, just late last month, I think it was on the 27th of March, we put one out with myself, uh, Andrew Whitelaw, our grains analyst, and Rob Herman, who does a lot in our wool space, uh, talking uh, generally about the whole COVID situation. So if you wanted to hear a podcast with regards to that, um, uh, that specific uh, topic, there's a good one there. If you just search back to the 27th of March, you'll be able to find that. Um, Courtney, I think that's pretty much done me. And I was a bit long tonight, but I thought it was well worth um, going through it in uh, good detail. So um, ready for yeah. questions whenever you are, Mike. Yep. Absolutely. Thanks, Matt. That was great. Um, pretty, pretty insight into how COVID-19 is already um, affecting the red meat market so far and um, some key considerations going forward. So thanks for that. Just before we get into some questions, I'm aware some of you might have to take off. So um, I just ask that you fill in the survey as you exit the webinar. It's really important um, that we get that feedback to help improve extension efforts and make sure that we're targeting the right topics for you. 
Um, so to kick us off, Greg has asked a question. Hi, Matt, do you think COVID-19 is driving a genuine reduction in consumption at the consumer level, or is it purely that that the ability to distribute product within the market um, that is impacting the price and consumption? Uh, it's a good question. It's probably hard to get a real feel on that, um, specifically in terms of the data, so it's probably more of an anecdotal question, which we try try to steer away from the Mercado. Uh, look, I, certainly there's there's been a definite drop off in that food service area in terms of that type of consumption. Um, and we and we did see at the retail level a spike across a few key commodities um, for a period of time. If you look at um, what happened uh, at the supermarket when the shelves were getting cleared out of a range of products, and certainly red meat was one of those. So I think there definitely was a genuine increase then. Um, some of the data I've seen more recently in the last week or so has shown that uh, at least at the retail level, some of that panic buying scenario has slowed down, and part of that's probably due to um, the supermarkets limiting items. But but I think also um, I think people are realising now that um, there isn't an actual shortage of product; it just was a supply chain issue. So um, that demand settled down somewhat. Um, I, I think um, so. So in the short term, I, I'd suggest that um, say for the food sector, definitely there's been a decline. For the retail, I think it was it, it's run its race in terms of that panic buying. Um, but I do think that when you're looking at from a longer term modelling perspective, um, there, there there is definitely an impact to um, the level of uh, demand across a range of countries based on that um, what's happening globally and economically. Uh, that's without a doubt, um, and and that's something that it can be modelled. Um, so yeah, the, the short term the short term situation we see now things a bit of noise, whereas. Um, Across the longer term, um, I think a, a move to a, a recessionary phase of two to three years is, is definitely going to have an impact on the price and on the demand um, in, that, in those export markets, whether they're for beef or for, for sheep meat. Um, the, the sheep meat and mutton market is a little bit more sensitive towards um, export, export um, demand movements. Uh, the beef market, like I said, tends to, um, the US tends to dominate uh, that market in terms of where the price goes because they're such a big um, a big player in that space. But um, in saying that though, that, you know, the um, the economic situation of both the US and, and some of those bigger economies in Europe and, uh, and Asia are also key to what happens with regards to um, beef demand. So um, it, it does drive it in, in a real sense. Yeah, okay. Thank you, um, Matt. So I've got another question from Steve um, and he knows it's sort of not beef related, but he's wondering why pork, um, why we've got pork at $3.20 per kilo when China um, are that short on protein? Uh, yep, good question. We don't, um, so Australia has, has no protocols to, to send pork to China. Um, we do some a small amount to Singapore, but um, it's a very small amount. So by and large, the Australian fresh pork market is pretty much consumed domestically. Um, and what we have seen uh, within that pork space, um, the, they're very, uh, pork producers, obviously it's an intensive operation. Um, uh, they're very susceptible to feed inputs. And so uh, in, in recent times, we have seen the price of pork coming off uh, domestically. Um, and, and part of the reason behind that is that spike we saw in feed grain prices that, um, that's hurt them a little bit there. Um, and also the, uh, the pork sector in Australia, I think it's around 25% of the sale of pork uh, within Australia goes into that food service sector. Um, so again, that and some of those um, producers that are you know are quite strongly aligned to that food service sector would have seen a significant um, decrease in demand uh, on the back of the lockdown phase there with the restaurants not operating. Um, so that's that's those two factors of the feed grain and the and the food service issue has meant that we've seen. Uh, a little bit of a, a reduction in price for uh, for pork. Um, in saying that, though, you know, you're talking like uh, it's about 11% since the start of the year, give or take, uh, reduction in pork price. Um, but we're coming off a very high base. So the, the Australian pork price through 2019 uh, went to to extraordinarily high levels, and that was all um, African swine fever induced. Uh, it wasn't so much that you know we weren't sending any product there, but what happened was that. Um, Given the gap that was created last year, um, the Chinese uh, consumer uh, was taking pork product from wherever they could get it, uh, and so you know, exhausting supplies out of the US and, and taking as much as possible from North uh, from Europe as well. 
Um, so uh, what it meant was that some of that product that comes through or would have come through to Australia in terms of preserved uh, pork product was getting um, was getting snapped up by China, and it did mean that um, that we, you know, the pork producer in Australia um, was able to um, see a significant increase in price of product for the, for they're selling here locally because we weren't getting as much uh, supply coming across. I think from overseas, it's about 40% of our of our intake is uh, is imported pork product, um, and so with less imported stuff coming through or coming through at higher prices, that that meant that um, the local price is able to go up as well. So we have seen pork coming off, but it's um, it's off a fairly high level. So uh, we're not anywhere near yet down to the levels we saw in the last few years, where um, you know, go back two years or so, and, and pork producers were were struggling to stay in business because the price of pork was so cheap and the price of grain was so high that margins were um, were very tough. Oh, yeah, cool. Thank you, Matt, and thanks for the question, Steve. Um, Lucy has written in um, looking at the domestic market for cattle. You spoke of grain price increase making feedlots a bit shy on the buy where do you see the best places to be selling over the next six months uh yeah good question that one as well look um that that reduction we saw with regard to feedlots looking at um that input uh, feed or input buying price that that was that was very much a reaction i think to that initial spike in grain prices. Um, and we have seen in, in just the last week or so that the, the grain price has started to um, come off those peaks. Um, so, you know, that, that's going to probably start to alleviate some uh, pain for feedlots. Um, the, other, the only other concern, I guess, is that finished year price um, and, and why that stays subdued, um, that's going to be a problem. Um, I think, uh, you know, in terms of where, where the best place to go, um, if you're looking at um, you know that that kind of 400 kilo, whether it's a feeder type, where, you know you're really only going to have a, a, a processor that's got an interest or a feedlot, so you're a bit trapped anyway as to which way you're going to go. Um, uh, I think given the the broader scenario, um, it's it's yeah, look, it's not you're going to have limited options as a as a producer as to where you can go. Certainly, um, I, I guess. Um, from that perspective, if you're in an operation where you, where you, you know, the, the breeding side of things that are able to sell younger and store cattle are probably going to have a better, a better go of it. Um, particularly if we get the type of season that's forecast, um, that there, there will be that restocker, restocker activity that's going to be, um, that's going to be uh, sniffing around. Um, the only, the only cautionary note I'd add for the restockers is just, you know, I know it's, I know it's difficult when you see all the grass in the paddock, but um, you have to keep an eye on what's happening. Uh, with regards to um, both those feeder prices and, and those uh, heavy steer prices, and that's going to be driven on what's happening from a global perspective initially, setting that finished price. Um, don't go too crazy um, spending up too much on store and young cattle as a restocker um, uh, if, if, if you can see that the global pitch is not looking too great. Um, for, for for those producers that are set, you know, sending into that, into that feeder kind of market or, or potentially looking at processes, um, it is going to be... Um, the fact that you're just going to have to, you know, take uh, take a little bit off what you're expecting. It's a shame because this year was was shaping up to be a record year for for finished cattle and feeder prices up until when COVID broke. But um, you know, it's just going to be the case that um, we're just going to have to revise our our optimism. Uh, but look, if you look back historically to prices uh, for beef uh, that you were getting, you know, five years ago or so. Uh, even if we take off a, a dollar or a dollar and a half uh, from, where, you know, from, from those peaks that we saw um, most recently, it's still not a bad price uh, at the end of the day. So what should um, producers who are looking to restock, what should be their trigger point? Um, you say be cautious. So is it that 200 cents per kilo US that you were talking about before? Oh, yeah. The 200 cents a kilo is the US price, and that's the one that we needed to get back up above that. So um, yeah. the best thing for a restocker, I think, would be to refer them back to that um, matrix that I had on that slide, um, and just you know to basically keep an eye on what's happening with regards to uh, that overseas situation. I guess it's a tricky one because you know if you're buying uh, those cattle, and if it's particularly if it's a grass grass trade, and you're backgrounding for a bit longer than what you would if it's a grain scenario, um, um, you, you know you've got to you, you know, you've got to have a bit of an idea as to what you're hoping to sell it for uh, in, you know, say, in a year's time, which is always tricky. Um, and that's where I think you've got to, you know, you've got to keep an eye on what's happening 
uh, in that overseas market because even if we do see a fairly robust cattle market this season for Australia because of the good the good climate and the and the tight supply, um, you know the market might hold up reasonably well even despite the offshore markets um, looking looking a bit sour. But it's only so it's only so long that the Australian market can can stay at those. Um, very narrow discounts to the US or indeed at a premium to the US. Like if, if I refer you back to that spread chart I showed at the start there, the third chart in, um, it, it doesn't last at these levels for long. Um, and so if you're looking at you know restocking now at a 300, 350 kilo animal as a backgrounder and, and, and putting on that weight, you're not going to be selling till you know this time next year, say. Um, you, you know, it, it may be the case that, um, you know, that, that if the global situation continues to deteriorate, uh, you know, over time that is going to weigh on finish prices here in Australia and, and that'll weigh again on feeder prices. Um, one thing one thing just reminded me too, though, I didn't say in the previous question was, um, and with regard to feeder prices, uh, one positive is that we are looking at um, as though we're going to get a very good harvest this year in Australia. Um, so, and like I said before, those grain prices, they peaked, but they have been coming off recently. Um, and my grains analyst, uh, Ed Mikado Andrew Whitelaw, is uh, very confident of, a, of quite a good harvest this season across the eastern seaboard. Um, and and he, he suspects that that's going to continue to pressure grain prices. Um, so from that situation, um, you know, even if we start to see finished cattle prices coming off, as long as um, the grain price can continue to come up as well, it might it might give a bit of room for those feedlots to to still get some margin in there and still be able to pay reasonable amounts for feeders years going in. Um, so it might not be all doom and gloom. That that weather will also not just help the restockers and the grass side of things. It's also going to help that grain price to continue to to soften through the through the season towards next harvest. Um, so so that'll be a bit of a um, a bit of an added bonus too if we can continue to see the grain prices coming off. Yeah. Yeah. Makes sense. Thank you. Um, so Stuart has asked, who um, who are the main alternatives or competitors for Australian red meat to fill that um, African swine fever protein gap in China? Uh, yeah, so if you look, if you're talking in the beef space, um, so US the US aren't really a competitor into the into Chinese market at, at all, really for Australia. Um, there have been on the back of the US China trade negotiation that was that was announced in mid January, they were trying to um open open the door to the US beef market, but that seems to have um fallen by the wayside. So in the beef space you're talking um New Zealand tends some product there, they tend to a lot of their product tends to go to those Chinese wet markets. So it's a different kind of segment to what the Australian product goes into. Um but then in terms of the bulk items, you're looking at the South American uh, producers, so Brazil Argentina, Uruguay, uh, they're, they're the ones. And if you look back to um, last season, uh, that type of uh, increased flows that we saw from Australia to beef into China uh, was mirrored across a lot of those countries. So Brazil had uh, much higher than uh, normal flows of beef into China, Uruguay, Argentina, uh, New Zealand all had you know really high flows. And, and that was because um, of that African swine fever scenario. And one thing to take away from that is that there won't be any one protein or any one country uh, that's able to satisfy the level of gap there. So um, yes, we have some competitors in that space, but um, if China get back up and running, and, and if um, you know if, if that and then African swine fever is not going to go away because there's still no cure for the virus and it's um, it's pretty resilient, um, that that demand is going to be there for, for this season. Uh, and it's going to be there not just for us, but for our competitors. And I think there'll be plenty. There'll be plenty for every every uh, exporter uh, country to to enjoy if China get back on their feet in the beef space. Um, in terms of the red, uh, the lamb and mutton space, uh, realistically, our, own, our only real competitors internationally, irrespective of whether it's China or elsewhere, is New Zealand. Um, New Zealand, uh, over the last 30 years or so, they've been in a in a stage where they've been declining. In their flocks, um, they, um, you know, so so from that perspective, um, their supply is heading south as well. Um, so, um, you know, uh, that 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 plays into the Australian situation. Well, if we can have a good season and start to rebuild the flock and have more product available, um, it's really only New Zealand that's the competitor. And and at the moment, um, within New Zealand, they're still uh, heavily focused on on growing their beef and dairy space, and and not so much their sheep meat space. Um, so they're becoming um, 
you know, they're still a competitor, but they're becoming less of a less less of volume uh, than what they were in say you know ten years ago. So um, so that again is also I guess in our favour uh, in terms of a competitor perspective. Yeah, very good. That's um good outlook. Um, thanks for that, Stuart, for the question. Um, we've got one more from Greg. Just. Um, conscious of time so if anyone else has any extra questions they want to ask them through now um, otherwise we'll be wrapping up after this question so Greg's asked um, what do you expect the basis and I think by that he means the relationship between the young cattle price and the um, national heavy steer price to do considering the strong restocker market uh, yeah so the, um, I mean, like I said before, the, the, the restockers will have to be conscious of how high they can chase this up. And I know it's a hard one, like I said, when I think it's termed grass fever, um, is, is, you know, they, they can tend to um, go a bit over the top. And we certainly saw some of that in 2016, 17, uh, where that, their basis widened out quite a bit. Um, I think uh, this season, it might, it, it may, it, up until, up until the break of COVID, I was expecting we're probably going to see a, a fairly aggressive um, widening of that basis, uh, uh, you know, more than what we saw in the 16, 17 period. Um, I think COVID now has put a little bit of a, uh, a cause for concern for some people there, you know, despite the, the better season. So I think it's going to mean that um, I think producers will be a little bit more, and, and certainly restockers will be a little bit more. Uh, cautious about how aggressive they go, so I suspect that we might not see that basis widen as much. Um, and, and certainly, if you contrast it back to the other thing in the favour, I guess, of the basis not widening too much, is um, is where the broader supply situation is sitting with regards to uh, the overall herd. We, we did see through um, the most recent drought, that 18, 18, 19, that small, uh, the, the drought we saw through mainly New South Wales and, and, and southern Queensland, that um, Despite that drought scenario, we did see finished cattle holding up their value quite well, and I think that was um, because of uh, the fact that we've got such a low herd and a low supply uh, at present that, that it meant um, you know we didn't see the normal kind of sell-off in, um, in in prices for finished items that we tended to see through the drought as well. Um, and so that's probably another fact that's going to mean that um, even with the uh, even with the uh, uh, offshore markets weighing down on and creating headwinds for, for finished year prices locally. Um, I think the fact that we're still in that tight supply scenario is going to mean that um, that you know the basis won't be able to get too far away in terms of that you know young cattle store cattle basis to the finished product either. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much for that, Matt. Um, I think that's all the questions that we have tonight. So with that, I'd just yeah like to thank you for your time tonight, Matt. It's been really insightful. Um, I'd like to remind everyone again, if as they exit, could they please fill out the survey? Um, bear in mind, there'll be another webinar coming up shortly. I'm sorry, I don't have the details for you tonight, but you will receive an email about that um, in the coming days. So thank you very much, Matt. Um, with that, I think I'll finish up for tonight. Thanks for that, Courtney, and thanks for everyone for uh, for joining. And uh, look, appreciate uh, MLA putting it on. Thanks very much.